Carol, in my early education, I assisted in a microbiology lab in terms of electrophoresis of DNA, and I've been interested in following that field. And of course, in my whole life, I've been interested in philosophy. But I, I never really combined the two um, and, and asked about a philosophy of molecular biology. Uh, you, as a philosopher of biology, deal very much with the nature of what life is, which to a large degree is related to molecular biology. So what do you as a philosopher bring to molecular biologists? I think I bring the same thing to molecular biology that I do to biology. Uh, that is to say, the perspective of an outsider. Uh, if you're a molecular biologist, there are certain assumptions you make, like the central dogma of molecular biology was an old assumption molecular biologists made. And that says that only proteins can be effective catalysts. And that had such, this uh, central dogma, this is one version of it, there are other versions of it, but that particular version of the central dogma of molecular biology had such a grip on the mind of molecular biologists and biochemists that when Tom Check did his initial work on uh, rib the discovery of ribozymes, he just couldn't believe the results that he was getting in his lab because uh, it was just, it violated the central dogma. And he put it away for an entire year because the results were just so incomprehensible to him, not because it violated fundamental chemistry, it didn't. It violated a dogma, not fundamental theory. And so as a philosopher looking outside in, I can look at these kinds of expectations and assumptions in a way in which somebody who's actually immersed in them cannot. And so as a philosopher working in molecular biology, for example, there are biochemists such as Steve Benner who are interested in creating synthetic life. And he has asked me to be on grants with him mm. because he wants my perspective. And once I talk to him about searching for anomalies, he goes, that's what I'm doing. I'm searching for anomalies. I hadn't thought about it that way. And he says, not only am I searching for them, I'm trying to make them. Mm. And so now he has a perspective about um, looking at his, uh, the results of his experiments in ways that he didn't have before from the perspective of a philosopher looking outside in. And so what specifically would that be if, if he now appreciates the, the power of an anomaly if you find it? And he then can create, will he then make um, a, a targeted efforts to create anomalies for certain characteristics? I mean, literally, how would it work? So he's interested in the origin of life. And he's interested in what, you know, so he puts together uh, synthetic microbes, basically, by, you know, sucking out the contents of a bacterium and putting in uh, a a genome that's been modified so that it has different nucleobases and uh, it codes for, say, different um, pro uh, amino acids, makes uh, potentially new proteins, has a different nuclear, uh, different genetic code. So he's looking for these variations. Um, but I think that if he is, shall we say, when we're, at least when we're talking, he's interested in even more radical possibilities. And he wants to sort of know how would you go about coming up with these more radical possibilities. And so a philosopher like me can suggest, well, have you thought of doing something different than just playing with molecules and sucking out the interior of, a, um, of the, you know, the nu nuclear material of a bacterium? Um, you know, what are the different possibilities that you can put together? What are, some, what are the answers? Uh, the answers are that um, he's exploring these possibilities. Uh, it's technical and it's hard to go much further beyond that. But you know, the origin of life, it's clear, didn't, it's clear that there's this big gap between prebiotic chemistry and living chemistry. And so what happened between that gap? You know, we, nobody, I don't think, in the, the field believes that you had the first organisms doing Darwinian evolution with a nice, neat mm -hmm. genome and uh, <clears throat> a set of proteins that it codes for. So how, how do you make sense and generalize on this basis? And I think these are the kind of things he's interested in exploring. Whether he's actually succeeded in doing that is another question. As you look at the whole field of molecular biology, what are the categories of uh, philosophical intervention, potentially? Um, I'm not sure how to answer that question. I know there are a lot of, uh, I'm, I'm actually not sure what you mean by that. 
Um, if, if you look, when a philosopher looks at, at the, the work of molecular biology, what are the kinds of questions that you would ask um, uh, about that field? So I think that a um, philosopher of molecular biology can ask fundamental questions about what different molecular compounds are possible with, for example, just organic molecules. Uh, so we think of nucleic acids. Well, you know, some chemists have considered the possibility of protein nucleic acids. Uh, mm. Those would be a different kind of uh, nucleic acid. So there are, are, we do, I think, know that most uh, hereditary molecules are going to be long chained molecules with repeating units uh, because that's how you get the stability uh, to have uh, them encode for without breaking down um, proteins. And you can also ask about what other kinds of structural and enzymatic molecules uh, form, you know, having both functions are possible. You might even ask whether or not you could have something that was both a hereditary molecule and also a structural molecule. Mm -hmm. A hereditary molecule and a, uh, and we know ribozymes, that was something we discovered, a hereditary molecule and an enzyme. So there are, uh, mixing these different functions molecularly would give you a really different form of life.